We're doing summer aid and we're doing aid for next fall spring. So this is a busy time of year for financial aid. Um, but if you have a question, I would rather you get it taken care of if you can today or if you call the office and get it taken care of as soon as you can because um, this is right now is an issue for you, but in August when your student comes back here, it's going to be move in and separation and make sure they got everything and a lot of this stuff may not be the forefront, may not be in the forefront of your mind. So see if we can get as many questions as we can to answer for you up front. And that way you don't have to worry about it later on. When, when do payments are going to be due for the semester coming up in the fall? The bill will probably be due August, I think it's August 10th, August 20th. Let me just take a look real quick because it is on the uh, website here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have the first August website up. And They will send the, once they determine tuition, that's when they'll send the bill out. They can't, they couldn't do it before then too. They didn't know which way to work. So you should be getting it soon after tuition is announced. Maybe you have till then. What happens if it's not paid by the 10th is there's a $25 late fee, and then August 23rd is when they'll drop classes for non-payment. So you actually have until that drop class. If you have any other questions, feel free to email us, you can call us, you can stop by, we'll be more than happy to answer them. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs and Director of Financial Aid here at Millersville. And what I wanted to do today was to talk to you um, about some of the things that I see as issues for your students coming in, give you some information and, and tell you about some things I see as issues, and then see if you have any questions for me that I can help you with here. And if I can't, you still got time, you can go to the Financial Aid Office for your specific questions because they're open today so you can go over and talk to somebody about your specifics. So what I want to tell you first is about what's, there we go. I'm assuming because you're here, most of you probably already filled out a FAFSA form. So um, the FAFSA is a free application for federal student aid and what that tells us is what your eligibility is for aid. And as you can see, what's happened, the applications that we've received have been going up and up and up. And you see where we are now. Lots of people applying for financial aid that didn't used to. And so we have more people applying, and ironically, less money available. So let me, this is actually for 11, 12, as opposed to 10, 11. I was changing that slide, and I didn't change that up to make it there. Tuition and fees is an estimate, okay, because we don't know what tuition is yet. The, the Board of Governors doesn't meet till the end of this month, and then they determine what tuition is going to be, and then they tell us. So what I do every year is do an estimate. So I did an estimate of what I think it's probably going to be. So keep that in mind. You'll be getting your bill. As soon as they set tuition, Verso's office will send the bill out, and then you'll know exactly how much your bill is going to be. The other things I do know what they are. Room, meals, tech fee, all of those are accurate for this upcoming year. Those are fees that we as an institution set, so that's why I can tell you what those are. Um, so for a year total, we're estimating it'll be about 17, and for a semester, about $8,600. So you can use that to at least start figuring out what you may have as a balance. But there's some other charges that we don't charge you, but the expenses that, that you still have. Um, what I do is I survey the students to figure out what do they spend, how much do they spend on these things. And then I take whatever they give me back and I take an average of it. So for personal expenses, toothpaste, soap, deodorant, that kind of stuff, it's about $1,750. Transportation, that's going back and forth home from, from school, Thanksgiving, Christmas, whenever they go back and forth average about $800, and it really varies depending on how far you're coming. Um, and then books and supplies, every time I ask a student how much their books cost, they say a million, about a million dollars. When I ask them to show me receipts, it comes up to about $400. But when you start looking at majors, if you're a science major, you're going to spend $100 a book. That's just how much those books cost. If you're an art major, you're going to have to buy supplies in addition to the books, and those supplies run you up. So, we gave them an allowance of about $1,000 about 
for books. This dude may not spend that much, but we, we kind of put that in there. So that comes up to about $3,550 or another $1,700 that you are not billed by the university that you could end up spending. So what we do in the aid office is we take federal, state, institutional aid, and we disperse that to the students who are eligible. So as you can see, every year it's been going up and up. So we're at this year, we're at 72 million. Next year, we'll probably be at 80. Um, so there is money that we are giving out, and a lot of it. There's two types of it, though. There's scholarships and grants, which is what everybody wants, and there's student loans, which is what everybody's going to get. Because grants and scholarships are limited. Everybody's eligible for a student loan. Everybody's not eligible for a grant or a scholarship. But I do need to tell you about this grant scholarship situation. Because when you come in as a freshman, the admissions office looks at your application, your student's application, and they are awarded scholarships based on merit. When you're, a, and there's only a limited amount of those scholarships. That's a very small, very small number. But once you become a Millersville student. We have about 300 scholarships that are available to students, but you have to have a Millersville grade point average in order to be eligible for those scholarships. So we get a lot of transfer students to come in, they've got a lot of credits, they've got great grades, but most of those credits weren't earned at Millersville. So if you came here, you get Millersville credits, that counts for you. The other big difference between the scholarships we have and the ones that admissions does is that the admissions office looks at your student's record and they determine based on that who gets what merit award. For the other scholarships, your student has to fill out an application, get it back in by a deadline in order to be considered. And unfortunately, what happens is because you did it and because somebody else did it their freshman year, sophomore year, what people typically do is just repeat whatever they did their freshman year. Well, they didn't fill out any application their freshman year, so they don't fill out an application. So we've got scholarship apps sitting out there and here's people who sit in my office and cry because they didn't know how they were going to pay for their students' education. And then the next year, we never see them again. And ironically, the next year is when there's more money available for them. But again, the student has to get the application. The student has to fill it out. The student has to turn it in. And that's where the problem comes, because they don't do it. That's your job. That's somebody else's job to do. The ones who do, a lot of them get stuff. So if your student needs money, and they're a good student, they need to be applying for these scholarships. Um, the other problem we have with them is that people self-select themselves out of the scholarships. For example, we have a scholarship that says $1,000 to any woman that, portrays, that pursues a major that portrays a positive image of women. What major does that? All of them. And every year, we only have one person apply for that, and it's always a non-traditional student, somebody that's over 25, apply. This year, we had a boom. They were both over 25. Because students looked at that and said, I'm a psych major, that doesn't do it. They self-select themselves out of it. Non-traditional older students, they figured that out. But we don't get that many applicants for it because they don't think so. Where do we find this application? The applications are in my office, in the hallway of my office, in Lyle Hall. The applications come out in November, late December, late November, December. Because the deadlines for them is usually February 15th. So what we say is, before they go home for Christmas, come by the office, grab the application, fill them out over Christmas break, bring them back in when they come back for the spring semester. A lot of them do, but a lot of them don't. Some people apply for everything, because there are some criteria in there. Some people apply for everything, the shotgun approach. If the credits come in, at least they're filling them out. So we do try to give, anybody that's eligible, we try to give them something. Did you have a question? They vary from scholarship to scholarship. Some of them say student in good standing. That means 2.0 and above. Some of them say 3.5 or better. So each scholarship may have different criteria. It depends on what the donor put in the stipulated as a criteria when they left the money. Because there's some that are very. Then they have to maintain a grade point average to keep getting it every year. So how do they apply for it? Did you have to apply for it? The admissions office selected people for that based on their high school grades. Okay. So you can't really apply for that. Okay. Um, and then if 
if somebody doesn't keep the grade point average, then they have alternates. They get they awarded to another student who is an alternate. Um, so it keeps it goes around. So the best thing to do is you got good grades, you get one. Keep your grades up if you can, because then you don't. That's that's tuition. So at least you have tuition covered. Student loans is the biggest piece of our aid, and that's something that everybody is aware of now because almost everybody here has a student loan and it's probably going to get even higher next year just because that's really a lot of what money is available right now. It's just loan money. So the other piece I want to talk to you about is, is your students because a lot of this has to do with them. Most of the students that I deal with don't budget their money. They don't even know how to budget their money. They've never even seen a budget. They've never had to do it before. Um, at the same time, they're really concerned about money. I had a ton of appointments before the end of the semester because the students were worried that they heard that tuition was going to go up and that the budget for the university was getting cut, and they were real worried that they wouldn't be able to pay tuition next year. They were real concerned about that. They were aware that it's going up. It could go up by 50%. How am I going to pay that? No, no, no. We didn't even know. We still don't even know today what tuition is going to be, but they were concerned about it. So they are aware of money issues. It's kind of a you know, kind of a dichotomy there that they don't budget any money they have, but they do worry about the money that they're going to have to spend. Half of them own a credit card, and most of them try to save money in, in places where they can. And, and I'll talk to you about that a little later, because that too is kind of a, eh. So financial literacy, and that's one of the things that we try to do here and do in the financial aid office, is explain money situations to students. I've tried every way I can to get through to them, to understand how to make decisions about money and, and make some good decisions. Because people make decisions about money all the time. They just don't always make good decisions about the money. And a lot of that comes because of wants and needs. Just that, that determination of what's a want, what's a need. And we talk about that because it's different. What they see as a need, I don't see it all the way. I see it as a want. And I try to explain that to them. And they'll understand by the time they're a senior, but freshman, sophomore, it's important to the student because they are going to be the ones incurring this debt. They're going to have to repay that. Um, they need to know how much it's costing them to be here. Um, it's their money. And if they don't know how much they're getting in debt, they don't know how much it costs to be here, they're not as concerned about the money. They make some, some decisions that wouldn't necessarily be in their benefit. You about to say something? Okay. It's important for you as a family because whatever, if you want your student to stay in school, whatever they don't do, they're expecting you to do. Help out. The more they know, the more they can help you out. For example, um, for most students, their freshman year is the most expensive year here. Even though cost goes up every year, they spend the most money, most people spend the most money in their freshman year. And that's because as a student's been here longer, they understand more about how to do things to save money, how to cut their costs. Freshmen haven't figured that out yet, they don't know that. Upperclassmen can figure it out. By the time they're junior senior, they know where, what I can do to cut my corners and cut my expenses. And they do. It's important for us as an institution because them having big debt affects our, and not paying it affects our default rate. And we want our students to know how to handle their money. We want them to understand money and make informed and educated decisions. Yes? Yes. I'm not financial literacy class, I mean, that uh, services that you provide to students, do you do it as a class or individual counseling? Is this a subject or like a forum? I try doing workshops with the students. Some of them ask me, the fraternities, the sororities, the organizations, they ask me to come to, their, come to their meeting and do a workshop with them on business. That's most of them that I do is because they invite me to come do it. But I also surveyed the students and said, how can I get through to you guys? Because everybody comes to me after they have a problem. I want to get you before you get to the problem. How do I get to you? What do I have to do to get you to get this information? And they said, put it on the web somewhere so we can find it, and we'll go get it. So if you go to our financial aid website, there's a, a section on the left-hand side called Cash Course. And if they click on that, that is a, a website that has a lot of stuff about financial literacy for students. How to budget, how to make a budget, how to plan for expenses. And we try to get them to go take a look at that so that they understand how to put their money in place, how to handle their money. Because other people come to me and they want to talk about 
They're going to move off campus and they get an apartment. They want to talk about the expenses. Well, they have enough money to afford it. And so we'll sit down and start going through the budget and seeing if they have enough money. And no, they don't. They think it's going to be less money for them to live off campus than it is on. And when we start going down all their expenses, no, it's going to cost them more. But unfortunately, though, most of them come to me after they already signed the lease. So now I'm sitting there looking at them saying, you got $900 a month in expenses and $400 a month in income. You're not going to be able to make this. And I always give them after the fact. A few come before then, and we sit down and go through how much is your rent? What about gas and electric? What about groceries? Most of them never been grocery shopping before. They've never gone on their own and bought food to last them for any period of time. They've never paid a, a bill, a gas and electric bill, cable bill. They've never done that stuff. So for them, they think about things compartmentally. So cable bill is here. Phone bill is here. Food is here. Rent is here. If you look at any of those things in isolation, it looks like I can do this. But they don't put it all together. That's why we get this budget sheet to sit down and say, what are you go what's going out every month? What's coming in every month? And then they get to see more. And after they see it, they make different decisions. The problem is we got to get to them sooner. And they don't come to me until they've already done it. So I'm trying to find a way. That's why I'm talking to you about it, so that you'll talk to them. We'll talk to them at orientation. If we hit them enough times, it'll sink in. And we also give them handouts and things when we can. We have handouts at our, in our office, but reality is freshmen, they're not thinking this. This is not, this is the furthest thing from their mind right now. So you heard a lot about how people are graduating with all this debt, so I wanted to just give you a reality check here. Um, average debt in Pennsylvania for four, five, four year public and private schools is 27,000. What the debt is for our last graduating class, the students that graduated, the average debt for them was 22,000. So it's not a small fee, it's not a small sum, but it's not 100,000 and 80,000 dollars that you hear about. And that's because it's news and it's media. So they're gonna talk about the extremes. If you go to med school, law school, you go to a high cost private institution, yes, you will probably end up graduating with a lot more debt than that. But for us here, our cost is such that you can't graduate from here with 70, 80,000 dollars of debt. Now we did have somebody that did, but she'd gone to a private school for two years before she got here then took out maximums on the loans in two years that she was here. So she already came here with $40,000 in debt, then took more loan than she needed to, and that's how we ran into it because we were trying to stop her from doing that. And she just didn't care. She just, I need the money, I gotta pay for these classes, I just gotta do this. And so I said, okay. She talked to everybody else on my staff, and they were like, you gotta talk to her. She's not hearing anything we're saying. So I said, well, let's think about it this way. What's your major? What are you gonna do when you graduate? I'm gonna be a social worker. Some guy that's 25 coming to a party. The students look at them. 
concerned about loans because they're closer to the end. They understand what, what's coming up. Cell phone, rent, food, car insurance, that's the stuff that they spend most of their money on. And most of them, believe it or not, do work, and they work enough to make those expenses manageable for them. They're, I mean, I think they're on the razor's edge because they're just a paycheck or a couple hours work from not being able to make their, make their um, bills. But most of them are making their bills. So I had a student come up to me, and she said that she was doing this um, project for her econ class and wanted to know if I could help her with this survey and interview students and find out how much they're doing on debt, and how much they knew about debt and everything. Well, I was going to do that anyway, but since she'd already started, she did all the questions. She, I just fine-tuned a little bit. She went out, surveyed the students, and came back and brought me the data. So I just said, I'll just use her data. 61% of the students that she surveyed said, had, surveyed said they had at least one credit card. Some students had as many as, many as six. They're a lot harder to get now, but some people had them already. They'd already gotten them. 43% of those students said that they've been late or missed a payment on something, a credit card, a loan debt, loan something they missed a payment on. 87% of the students didn't know the difference between a subsidized and unsubsidized loan, even though they had both. Um, and 80% of them did not know their credit score. That's not really a surprise because for them, a credit score doesn't really mean anything. But how did they get this credit stuff going up like that? So I've got to explain. Our survey data came up, this is a national student survey, and it came up close to what ours did, so I just used theirs. I was surprised to see clothes as the number one thing that they spend money on. How can that be? The college students, they're not going out to formals every week. How can that be? And I didn't have to look any further than my office to find out the answer to that question. One of my student workers, she never wears the same pair of sneakers twice in a month. She has enough that she can wear a different pair of sneakers every single day and never repeat them. And she only wears Nike. You know how much they cost. So she has to have those Nike sneakers. And she's got 31 pairs of Nike. She doesn't repeat them. She also had this little jacket on. Only from here to here. Half a jacket. 80 bucks. I said, you didn't even get, you only got half a jacket, 80 bucks. But isn't it cute? I'm like, look. And the, and the jeans, and I'll tell all of them about this. I talk to students everywhere about this. The whole ripped jean thing. They can't go by jeans at Walmart and put a hole in them, they got to go buy the ones with the hole in them. That costs more money. And it's useless for me to have this conversation because they say, oh, Mr. Woods, you used to have somebody's father. And then, yeah, I am somebody's father. And I do see, I see you wasting money on that stuff. But that's why, and it's the females more than the guys. The guys will spend a lot of money on sneakers and they may buy some jeans, but, and they buy expensive sneakers too, but the women spend more money than the guys do on clothes. That's why, and most of our students here are female. So that's why they end up at the top with the clothes thing. And I'm saying, <coughs> most of the guys don't even recognize or acknowledge the fact that you got on a different pair of sneakers. Well, they're not dressing for the guys. They're dressing for the other females. Anyway, <laughs> how does auto and gas get to be that high when most of the people here don't drive? How can that be? It's because they don't drive but they know somebody who does. And in my, back in my time, when you wanted to use, when I remember I used to drive, and so people wanted to ride with me, you had to give me some money for the gas. And everybody chipped in and paid for the gas. They're still doing that. It's just that, see, we don't change dollars and coins anymore. We swipe a card. So all of us are going to go out. I'm driving. You paying for the gas this time. So we use your card, and we swipe, and we pay for my gas this time. Next time we go out, you're paying for it. We use your card, and we swipe. Everybody's chipping in, but they're chipping in by helping out with that. And then if my car breaks down, but well, we all want to go and I need a new water pump, everybody help me out here, pay for my water pump, then we can go back out again. That's where that's coming from. They're helping each other out so that they can still go out and do the things that they do. Food is up there because you're getting in the car to go out, you're going to eat. You're going out, that's what they do. They socialize, they go out and eat. Red lobster is a big one. Red lobster, oh, sorry. Um, tuition and stuff, okay. Now, when they don't have enough money to cover some of the other things, they'll use a credit card and buy books and all. Now, entertainment, that too comes in with the with going out.
spending the money when they go out and put it. Travel, we understand that because they are traveling. They're going different places, spring break, fall break, weekends, and other miscellaneous. Electronics, though, is the one that really got me because I said, everybody's got one of these. Everybody's got an iPhone. I always say to them, why do you have an iPhone? What do you do with it? You text, you get a call, you make a call. Why do you need an iPhone to do that? Every other phone does that too. Why do you need it? No, they gotta have it, because everybody, everybody has one. I mean, you gotta have it. No, you don't have to have it. Yes, you do. And they crack on me hard because I got it. I have the Blackberry. Why do you can't have it? You don't iPhones can do this, that. All I do is I get a call, I make a call, and I check my email. That's all I do. So I don't need all of that stuff. I'm not paying for that because I don't need it. They need it. Why can't you get the cheap phone with it? And they say, I can't walk around with a prepaid phone. People think I'm poor. What do you want poor? You don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> but they can't look poor. So I gotta have what everybody else, as far as I'm with the clothes and with the but I still was bothered by how can electronics, how can the phones and the computers and all, how can that be at the bottom of the list? That should be at the top because everybody has it. Do you know why it's at the bottom of the list? Because they're not paying. That's why it's at the bottom of the list. They don't want to be a price. So it's lower. But I try to have these conversations with students. I have lots of conversations with them. We talk about everything. A birth control release agreement. We talk about everything. Because if you talk about pe to people about money, it opens the door for everything. I know what's going on in your house. I can tell you that now. I know everything going on in people's houses. Because once people start talking to you about that, they talk to you about everything. And I can tell you, the biggest thing I can say to everybody is, don't call your kids with your drama. Because as much as your son or daughter may not talk to you or doesn't give you a whole lot of information, if you tell them there's something wrong at home, it throws them all off. It throws off that whole day, the whole week, the whole month. They stress about it. They worry about it. They may not tell you, but they tell me. They tell us. They're real worried about what's going on at home. Somebody loses a job, their grades go down. Somebody has a problem or sick, their grades go down. Because they're worried about what's going on at home. A lot of that loan money they took out wasn't for them. The reason our loans jumped over the previous couple of years wasn't because we gave them more. It's because they came back to us because mom lost her job and they had to pay this bill. They're taking out more loan money so they can go back and pay that bill at home. They do care about home. They care a lot about home, regardless of what they show you. They cry in my office about home because they're worried about what's going on with you. So what I say is be aware, be aware of that. Know that your students want to they will. And they're going to do whatever they have to do to help you out. The other thing is that at Christmas, I tell everybody, don't expect your kids to get you stuff at Christmas, because they will. Whatever they did, that was, that was the tradition, they're going to keep it up. I tell you, Christmas, all they should be giving at Christmas is good wishes. They're college students. They shouldn't be out there buying stuff. But they will get a job, go work at the mall, all kinds of crazy hours, to make this money so that they can buy stuff for, for mom. I don't know why dad doesn't get it. It's for mom. I gotta get my mom this, I gotta get my mom that, I can't just go home. It's gotta be for mom, it's all about mom. But they will work crazy hours at the mall. Now we have jobs on campus and we try to tell them, work on campus because on campus, we know when Christmas is coming, we know when your exams are coming and your finals and all that, we give you consideration for that. At the mall, they give you extra money for that. If you work over these hours, you can make more money and of course they're gonna make more money because they can always study later. They can spend time on that stuff later. Let me make the money now because I gotta get mom this gift and because I need this phone, I need these clothes, I need this, so they will work more hours and it always impacts them negatively. So I'm telling you about this so that you'll be aware, so that you can talk to them before they get here because again, I'll see them, but I'm gonna see them after the fact. I'm gonna see them when it's a little late. So, and they don't, they don't wanna hear this message. This message isn't one that's gonna resonate right now for them. They're more worried about who I'm gonna live with, who the cute girl is, the cute guy is, Will I be able to handle the class? What is, that's what's going through their head. Money is the last thing on their mind. But it's got to be on our minds. We got to talk to them because we can't let them dig themselves in the holes they can't get out of. And it starts now. My 11-year-old son knows much more about finance than a lot of these college students because we talk about wants and needs. He understands that. And the other thing is, he has his own money. He gets paid for doing this stuff. He has his own money. You want that? You can get it. His money is a whole different thing than when it's my money paying for it. And I think every parent has that. You know, they see something they want. Dad, can I have that? And if, and if I look at it and I say, mm, that looks pretty expensive. Yeah, you can get it. If you want to pay for it, you can get it. Well, all of a sudden, that, that calculation goes on. Do I need it? Do I want it? Mm, I think I just want it. Because it needs basically to take care of. Not just the 
God takes care of you. You mourn. You don't have to pay for that. And it's amazing how much clearer the decision becomes when it's something that I have to pay for. So I talk to them about money. And I talk to your kids about money, and I will. And I'll try to tell them to make good decisions. They'll make some mistakes, but they usually learn from it. I just don't want to see them make a mistake they can't recover from. Okay? So I know, see, I'm out of time now. I always, this always happens. I always get off on these stories. So anyway, do you have any questions for me? Financial aid office is open. I don't have specific information about your situations. Um, I'd have to actually go back to the office for that because I don't have access to your accounts here. Yes? The plus funds, when you call for a plus fund, we have to wait until you're forgiven or pay on that request until it's due for next month. If I was you, I would wait until you know what your costs are going to be. And you won't know that until you know what tuition is. Now, some people have been anxious and they said they wanted to make it, they wanted to get it now and get it taken care of. Um, I say wait until you get your bill because it takes that much time to turn a plus loan around. So you'll have plenty of time. Um, but at least wait and see what your costs are. One of the questions somebody asked before was, well, what if what we get offered in aid and what our bill is, there's a, there's a gulf in there, there's a, dis a difference. How do I make up that difference? And there's some ways you can do that. You can, there's an alternative, what's called an alternative loan, which is a, an educational loan that's based on a co-signer's credit worth. So they used to give them out like candy back at least as, as, as late as a year ago. But the banks all stopped doing that when the economy went bad. And part of the reason it went bad is because they were giving loans to anybody. And they did a lot of that. So now they tighten up the criteria. You can't just get one like that anymore. So you have to, we put some of the lenders on our website. You can look at all the major lenders are offering them, but their interest rates are higher. And they have to have a credit worthy, the student has to have a credit worthy co sign. But the payments are deferred until the student graduates from college, just like they are with um, student loans. And then there's a payment plan. You can pay X amount of dollars. You subtract your financial aid from your bill, and whatever's left over can be broken out into 10 monthly payments. You can pay it that way. Um, you can always write a check. You can pay it that way. There's different ways you can do it. Home equity loans, you can do the difference that way as well. Yes, uh, the Stafford loan, is that the one with the deferred interest? Or? Yes. Okay. The, unsub the subsidized Stafford loan. The unsubsidized Stafford loan. Federal Unsubsidized loan is a loan. It's, it's the same loan except that the, the interest is due quarterly. The need-based loans is subsidized. Un, the non-need-based loan is unsubsidized. So it has a quarterly interest payment that's due. And I would say if you have that loan, it's better to pay the quarterly interest than to let that capitalize because then that just adds that interest on top of interest and it's bigger at the end. Okay. And what's the loan that is due for interest on that? Like four years. That's the the. Subsidized staff of loan. Any other questions about money? All right. Well, if you do have other questions, if you think of something after today, financial aid office.